The Sydney B. Sperry Symposium is an annual academic conference held at Brigham Young University. The symposium honors the memory of former religious education instructor Sidney B. Sperry. The theme for the 2004 symposium is Prelude to the Restoration, From Apostasy to the Restored Church. This address by Dana Pike was given on October 29, 2004. Dr. Pike teaches in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's nice to, uh, nice to welcome you out tonight. The pillar of light that fell upon Joseph Smith in the woods near Palmyra, New York in the spring of 1820 ushered in a new dispensation of the gospel. But that light, which shone above, above the brightness of the sun, did not just enlighten the world as far as religion is concerned. The light emanating from the pillar in which the father and son stood symbolically represents the latter-day divine illumination of many aspects of life on this earth, past, present, and future. I follow this observation, which I believe to be true, with the second one. The Lord did not restore his church in a historical, cultural, or political vacuum. He prepared a world context into which he restored his church in order to facilitate the spread and acceptance of his gospel. With all the great discoveries of ancient cities and artifacts and the successful decipherment of many ancient languages during the past 200 years, it is easy for us to forget that before the year 1800, very little was known about the ancient world of the Bible. Just as religious truth was lost between the time of the Bible and the modern era, so too much of the knowledge of the ancient peoples of the world of the Bible was lost. Prior to 1800, the Bible itself and some Greek and Roman texts were our only sources of information about such people as the Egyptians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Persians. Modern people could not read any of the inscriptions or other documents originally produced by these ancient people. There is no doubt that the great accumulation of historic and linguistic knowledge that we now have about the ancient world of the Bible began in the 1800s. At the same time, the Lord was restoring doctrine and authority to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith. My thesis is that this correlation, the restoration of the gospel and the rediscovery of the ancient world of the Bible, is not a coincidence, but is part of the Lord's work in the fullness of times to gather together in one all things, both which are on heaven and which are on earth. The early recovery of the ancient world of the Bible was part of an integral part of the world context for the restoration and the gathering together of all things in one. As such, this recovery of ancient artifacts and documents provides us with a much greater understanding of the background and the contents of the Bible and other restoration scriptures and of the Lord's work in all dispensations. The Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, and the ancient world of the Bible all literally came forth out of the dust at the same time. To make sure we're all together on this, I'm using the expression, the world of the Bible, to designate the countries and cultures with which the ancient Israelites interacted, as recorded in the Bible. This region has traditionally been called the Near East and is more commonly called today the Middle East. It stretches from Turkey in the west, going eastwards through Iraq and into Iran. It also stretches down along the, through the eastern Mediterranean countries, Syria, Lebanon, Israel or Palestine, Jordan, and the Arabian Peninsula, and also into northeast Africa and the country of Egypt. Before we can discuss the recovery of the world of the Bible, we must first set the stage by quickly reviewing political conditions in the Middle East from the late 1790s to 1850. Following a series of impressive victories, Napoleon Bonaparte became a general in the French military in 1794, five years after the outbreak of the French Revolution. By 1797, the French had trained their sights on Great Britain, their only serious European competition. Rather than attempt an invasion of e England, as many people expected, Napoleon took his forces to Egypt to block the British trade and communication opportunities through the strategic Isthmus of Suez. This 100-mile stretch of land provided an important alternative to circumnavigating Africa in order to reach expanding British interests in India and the Far East. 
The local Egyptian forces were no match for Napoleon's far better trained and equipped troops, and he quickly took control of Egypt in July 1798. As you can see in the picture displayed here, Napoleon and his forces are fighting the Egyptians with the pyramids in the background. At this time, Egypt was part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, the capital of which was located in Istanbul, as we call it now, formerly known as Constantinople. Although within the orbit of the Ottoman Empire, Egypt had always enjoyed a certain amount of autonomy. The Ottoman Empire had reached its peak during the 1500s, controlling much of the Middle East and Eastern Europe. By the 1700s, economic and military setbacks were contributing to this long-lived empire's demise. Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798 dramatically changed relations between Europe and the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire became much more involved in political and economic interaction with several European powers, especially Britain, France, and Russia. Similar political circumstances existed between several European nations and Persia, the Ottoman Empire's rival further to the east in what we call today Iran. In January 1799, Napoleon invaded Palestine from Egypt, planning to go on to conquer Syria. He only got as far north as the city of Accra, now called Akko, Israel, just north of modern Haifa, where he laid siege to the city. But by then, his troops were too weary, too ill, and insufficiently equipped to capture the well-fortified Accra. Experiencing his first career defeat, Napoleon headed back to Egypt in late May 1799. The French defeated Ottoman forces near Alexandria, Egypt that summer, and Napoleon returned to France later in 1799 to become its new political leader. A year and a half later, in, uh, in uh, 1801, an Ottoman-British coalition drove the French forces from Egypt. Another development with importance for this study took place about two decades later. The Egyptian Pasha, or governor, Muhammad Ali, took advantage of his military strength and relative autonomy to seize control of Syria and Palestine from the Ottoman Empire in 1831. Nine years later, in 1840, the British helped the Ottomans drive the Egyptians out of Syria and Palestine. As a result of such political and military dynamics, three important developments occurred in the Middle East that significantly affected the recovery of the ancient world of the Bible. First, in addition to troops, Napoleon had taken about 170 French scholars with him to Egypt in 1798, including scientists, naturalists, draftsmen, geographers, engineers. They studied, mapped, and recorded the human and natural wonders of Egypt and to a lesser extent Palestine in an unprecedented way. Their multi-volume report entitled Description of Egypt, published in French beginning in 1809, helped precipitate a considerable new interest in contemporary Egypt and especially in its ancient inhabitants. Second point. In July 1799, French soldiers who were enlarging their fort near the port town of Rashid, Egypt, discovered an inscribed stone that had been reused in an old wall. Rashid is located about 35 miles east of Alexandria, and it used to be called Rosetta. This, the, ins the inscribed stone discovered by Napoleon's soldiers is now known as the Rosetta Stone, and it played a key role in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics. Third, as just mentioned, Palestine was under the control of the Egyptian Pasha, not the Ottoman Empire, from 1831 to 1840. This situation provided much more favorable conditions for travel in the Middle East than had been the case in previous decades, and many Westerners came for adventure and for economic and religious reasons. The amount, of Egyptian, the amount of Egyptian Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land from the 1500s to the 1700s was quite limited due to the Middle Eastern dominance of the Ottoman Empire. However, after Napoleon's exploits dramatically brought the world of the Bible into the publish, public consciousness of Europeans and Americans, the Middle East became a destination for many Western travelers with religious and other interests. Some of these new travelers to the Middle East published travel logs and journals that were very popular in Europe and in North America. 
Thus, the increased interaction between European governments and the Ottomans and Persians, combined with a spirit of adventurism and improvements in travel opportunities like improved steamboat uh, technology around 1830, that produced a vastly increased European and American awareness of the Middle East. This awareness provided new vistas of opportunity and discovery and religious outreach in the early 1800s. The majority of Middle Eastern population at the time was Muslim, both, but communities of Jews and Christians were scattered throughout the region. Most of the Christians were Eastern Orthodox, although there were a number of Roman Catholics as well. Protestant Christianity was not legally recognized in the Ottoman Empire at this time, and Protestants in general had previously exhibited little interest in the land or the holy sites of the Bible prior to 1800, but that significantly changed in the early 1800s. I will now recount some of the notable accomplishments in the exciting story of the early recovery of the ancient world of the Bible to demonstrate how remarkable and how influential these achievements were. Not surprisingly, most of the individuals involved in this recovery process were possessed of natural curiosity, a great deal of energy and courage, and many were quite gifted with language skills. Since time does not permit full coverage of all the countries in the Middle East, I will highlight activities relating to three of them, Egypt, Iraq, with a certain amount of attention to Iran as well, and Israel, Palestine. We'll begin with Egypt. By the early Christian centuries, the ability to read any of the ancient Egyptian scripts was entirely lost. Most people presume that Egyptian hieroglyphics represented some sort of symbolic code. A few Egyptians, uh, oops, a few Europeans had attempted to make sense of hieroglyphics in the 17th and 18th centuries AD, but no one made any real progress until the re discovery of the Rosetta Stone by Napoleon's soldiers in the Western Nile Delta in 1799. This damaged monumental inscription had originally been erected at an Egyptian temple in 196 BC by the Greek king of Egypt, Ptolemy V, to commemorate the first anniversary of his reign and to publicize privileges that he had granted to the priests of Egypt. It does not make for very exciting reading. Its great value for us, however, lies in the fact that the inscription was written in two languages, same message in two different languages, Egyptian and Greek. And the text was engraved in three scripts, Egyptian hieroglyphics, Egyptian Demotic, which is a cursive form of hieroglyphics, and the Greek alphabet. European scholars could read the Greek version of the text, which provided an important tool to eventually decipher the two Egyptian versions. When the British defeated the French in Egypt in 1801, the Rosetta Stone was ceded to the British, who shipped it off to London in 1802. The Rosetta Stone is still on display in London in the British Museum. While the Rosetta Stone was not the only inscription utilized in the decipherment of ancient Egyptian scripts, it was, a, it was an especially significant tool and it appropriately symbolizes this great accomplishment of decipherment. The following highlights demonstrate the significant way in which scholars, as well as plunderers, were involved in the modern recovery of the Egyptian portion of the ancient world of the Bible during the early 1800s. In this presentation, I've only included some of the many accomplishments that could be listed. Before we get to those accomplishments, and just to refresh your memories so you can appreciate the correlation between these discoveries and the restoration of the Lord's Church, let's just run through a, quick, a few quick dates relating to the restoration. Joseph Smith was born in 1805. He received his first vision in 1820. In 1827, Joseph received the plates from Moroni in which the Book of Mormon was preserved, and the church was officially organized in 1830. The prophet was martyred in 1844, and Brigham Young and some of the saints who followed his lead first arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. Now, back to the recovery of ancient Egypt. As I've already mentioned, the Rosetta Stone was discovered by French troops near Rashid, Egypt in 1799. 1802, the British shipped the Rosetta Stone to London, and the Greek portion of the inscription was translated. 
1809 to 1816, Napoleon scholars published a multi-volume report dealing with the antiquities of Egypt, the description of Egypt, it was called. In 1813, a Swiss-born explorer, James Lewis Burkhart, was the first European to discover the monumental statues of Ramses II and Nefertari carved into the side of a cliff at Abu Simbal, about 170 miles south of the modern Aswan Dam. 1814 to 1819, Englishman Thomas Young made important advances in beginning to understand Egyptian demotic and hieroglyphic scripts. He summarized his efforts in an Encyclopedia Britannica supplement entry in 1819. In 1817, a fellow named Giovanni Battista Belzoni, one of several competing European plunderers in Egypt, formerly known as the Italian giant, having served as a circus strongman, began excavating the Abu Simbel temple beneath the statues of Ramses II and Nefertari. In that same year, 1817, Belzoni also discovered the tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh Seti I, the father of the famous and powerful Ramses II, in the Valley of the Kings across the Nile River from Luxor. Such plundering or excavations, as we politely call them, were ongoing for years in several parts of the Valley of the Kings and throughout Egypt. In 1818, Belzoni opened the second of the Great Pyramids at Giza, the tomb of Kephron, and entered into its royal burial chamber for the first time in millennia. In 1820, the year of Joseph Smith's first vision, Belzoni mounted an Egyptian, an exhibition of Egyptian artifacts in London and published a book on his adventures in the Egyptian tombs. 1822, Jean-Francois Champollion, a brilliant young Frenchman who built on the work of Thomas Young, publicized his initial success in dis deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics. Two years later, in 1824, Champollion decisively demonstrated that he had deciphered the basic system of hieroglyphics. Not to take anything away from him, it's important to understand that Champollion discovered hieroglyphics on a rudimentary level. The complete work of decipherment extended many decades beyond his lifetime. In 1836, the year in which some important divine manifestations occurred in the Kirtland Temple is recorded in DNC 110, one of the two obelisks in front of the Luxor Temple in Egypt was, were tra was transported to Paris and erected in the Place de la Concorde, where it still stands today. 1842, a German scholar, Karl Richard Lepsius, published the Turin copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And in 1842 to 1846, Lepsius led a productive German expedition to Egypt in which he made casts and copies of important script inscriptions and carvings and later publishing a 12 volume work on the monuments of Egypt and Ethiopia. You can see how closely these activities in recovering the ancient world of Egypt and the deciphering Egyptian scripts correlate with the time period of the restoration of the Savior's church through Joseph Smith. We'll now turn to Iraq, where in antiquity, Assyria and Babylonia were located. The Greek name for this region, now occupied by Iraq, is Mesopotamia. Ancient Persia was located further to the east in what is now Iran. The wonders of ancient Assyria and Babylonia lay under a much greater blanket of obscurity than did the ruins of ancient Egypt. About all that was left of these distant Iraq civilizations in the early 1800s were large, flat-topped mounds, destroyed cities covered by the dust of ages that dotted the fairly flat countryside between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. While the Mesopotamian ruins were less immediately spectacular than the uh, Egyptian ruins, the Englishman Austin Henry Laird expressed the profound emotion that these mounds stirred within him when he said, quote, these huge mounds of Assyria made a deeper impression upon me, gave rise to more serious thought and earnest reflection than the Roman temples of Baalbek in Lebanon or the theaters of Ionia in Western Turkey. The writing system used by the ancient Assyrians and Babylonians and Persians is called kineiform, wedge-shaped inscriptions. Each sign represents a syllable in a word. Some signs represent complete words. 
Carved into rock and pressed into soft clay tablets, this stylized script was employed in one form or another for about 3,000 years. A few 17th and 18th century travelers brought small cuneiform inscriptions from Mesopotamia and Persia back to Europe, and fledgling efforts were made to decipher this arcane script. But only in the early 1800s did scholars and amateurs alike inaugurate the large-scale recovery of Mesopotamian and Persian texts and artifacts. The following are a few highlights that demonstrate the significant way in which Mesopotamian and Persian Persian portion of the ancient world of the Bible began to be recovered in the early 1800s. 1802, even before Joseph Smith was born, a young German academic named Georg Friedrich Grotefendt successfully deciphered some of the characters used in Persian cuneiform, focusing on personal names in a bilingual inscription. 1807 to 1816, Claudius J. Rich, a British agent in the Middle East collected artifacts and mapped Mesopotamia during his travels, providing reliable accounts of the ruins of Babylon, Nineveh, and other ancient cities in such publications as his memoir on the ruins of Babylon. Anybody read that? Published in 1815. 1835, Henry Creswick Rawlinson, who later served as British consul in Baghdad, began copying the trilingual inscription of King Darius, Persian king, at Bisatun, Persia. The next year, 1836, two European scholars independently established the value of all the signs in the Persian cuneiform script and worked out readings of geographic names. 1842, the American Oriental Society was founded. Still in existence today, it is dedicated to studying the languages and civilizations of Asia, including the Middle East, which is located in Western Asia. 1843 to 1844, Paul Emile Botta, a French consul in Mosul in northern Iraq, excavated and made amazing discoveries at Khorsabad, the ancient Assyrian city of Dur Sharukin, the ruins of a capital city built by Assyrian king Sargon II in the late 700s BC. Sargon was the Assyrian king responsible for deporting thousands of Israelites from the northern kingdom of Israel, who eventually became the so-called lost tribes of Israel. And we can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 17. In 1844 and 1847, Rawlinson copied the Elamite and Babylonian cuneiform versions of the trilingual inscription of Darius at Bisatun, Persia. 1845 to 1851, the Englishman Austin Henry Laird excavated at Nimrud, the ancient Assyrian city of Kalhu in northern Iraq, and uncovered some wonderful and startling large monumental sculptures there. Major finds at Nimrud included the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, now located in the British Museum. One portion of this monument depicts Jehu, king of Israel, bowing in submission before King Shalmaneser III of Assyria. We can read about King Jehu in 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10. This representation of Jehu on the black obelisk is the only contemporary physical representation that we have of anyone named in the Old Testament. In 1846 to 1851, Austin Henry Laird also excavated at Nineveh, the city to which the Lord sent the prophet Jonah. Nineveh is now known as Tel Kuyunjik, or at least a portion of it's known as Tel Kuyunjik. Nineveh is located just across the Tigris River from modern Mosul, Iraq. Laird's exceptional discoveries included the celebrated library of Assyrian king Ashurbanipal and the discovery of Assyrian king Sennacherib's palace, the decorations of which included wall carvings depicting the destruction of the Judahite city of Lachish by Sennacherib in 701 BC. We can read about Sennacherib's invasion of Judah, 2 Kings 18 and 19. In 1847, the first modern exhibition of Assyrian sculpture and artifacts was mounted at the Louvre Museum in Paris, displaying Bota's discovery from Khorsabad. As Brigham Young and some of the saints rolled into Salt Lake Valley, many of the Parisians were seeing Assyrian sculpture and artifacts for the first time in several thousand years. 1847 to 1852, 
Edward Hinks succeeded in successfully deciphering Mesopotamian cuneiform used by the Assyrians and Babylonians. 1849, Laird's publication of Nineveh and its remains was greeted with great public acclaim. 1850, Laird conducted preliminary excavations at ancient Babylon. 1850 also, Rawlinson's book entitled A Commentary on the Cuneiform Inscriptions of Babylonia and Assyria was the first modern description of the Assyrians to employ some of their own texts as sources. Today, we would never think of writing about the Assyrians or any of these other ancient cultures without including extensive research and on and quotations from their records. But that didn't happen in modern times until about a century and a half ago. Again, we see the chronological correlation of such activities with the events of the Restoration. You probably noted that real progress in Iraq and Iran came a few years later than the progress in recovering ancient Egypt. We'll now turn to the third region under review, Israel or Palestine. It's comparatively quite small as you look at it at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. As Yehoshua ben Arya has observed, quote, at the beginning of the 19th century, the early 1800s, Palestine was but a derelict province of the decaying Ottoman Empire. Its economy was primitive. The sparse, ethnically mixed population subsisted on a dismally low standard. The few towns were small and miserable. The roads were few and neglected, end quote. Many, if not most, of the ancient towns mentioned in the Bible could no longer be accurately identified. And even the once prominent city of Jerusalem was relatively small and depressed. No wonder so many European and American travelers to Palestine in the early 1800s were surprised and dismayed by what they encountered. Several factors, however, attracted people to the region. One motivation was the desire to explore a relatively unknown area. Another economically related uh, motivation was uh, based on national interest was to find or attempt to find productive new trade routes. The Bible itself was another impetus for encountering the Holy Land. Developing out of such factors as one, the expectation that many people had that the end of the world was just around the corner in 1800. Two, the Napo Napoleonic Wars, which were ongoing in Europe until 1815. And three, the Great Awakening, or the Second Revivalist Movement in the United States. Developing out of such factors, Christian missionary societies in the United States and Great Britain were organized in the early 1800s to carry Bibles and the message of Christ to every corner of the earth. This, of course, included Palestine and the rest of the Middle East. Others who traveled to Palestine were more intent on recovering the ancient world of the Bible than on converting its modern inhabitants. Many biblical sites, as mentioned, were no longer identifiable, and local traditions on the locations of some sites were definitely incorrect. Much improved traveling conditions in Palestine in the 1830s, resulting from the uh, conquest of Egyptian Pasha Muhammad Ali and his taking control of that region from the Ottomans in 1831. Many explorers from European countries in America roamed the land desiring to visit the ancient sites recorded in the Bible. The activities of one man with an interesting Latter-day Saint connection are worth quickly noting at this point. A fellow named John Lloyd Stevens, born in 1805, was an American explorer and author. Stevens is best known for his travels to southern Mexico and Central America in 1839 to 1841. His books on ancient Mayan ruins complete with wonderful illustrations by the illustrator Englishman Frederick Catherwood generated a great deal of interest among Americans among Americans, even eliciting a comment in the October 1st, 1842 edition of the Latter-day Saint publication, Times and Seasons. Stevens, however, had earlier traveled in the Middle East in 1836, and his travel log entitled Incidents of Travel in Egypt, Arabia, Petra, and the Holy Land became very popular after its publication in 1837. Of particular interest to Latter-day Saints, is that John Lloyd Stevens, who graduated from New York City's Columbia College, now called Columbia University, Stevens graduating in 1822 at the age of 17, has been described as the favorite pupil of Columbia professor Charles Anton, who has himself been described as America's most famous classicist at the time. The name of Charles Anton, of course, is familiar to students of the Book of Mormon, and I will mention him again in a few minutes. 
Stevens, like so many other travelers to Jerusalem, recounts that he stayed in the Latin convent, now named St. Savior's Convent, just as Orson Hyde did five years later in 1841. The following highlights demonstrate the significant way in which the knowledge of the land of Israel-Palestine, the heart of the world of the Bible, began to attract attention and to be recovered in the early 1800s. 1805 to 1807, a German explorer named Ulrich Zitzen traveled through Syria and Palestine. He ended up discovering or rediscovering the ruins of Jerash and Amman, two important sites in modern Jordan. In 1810 to 1812, John Lewis Burkhart, who we've met earlier in Egypt, traveled from Syria down the Jordan Rift Valley and rediscovered the fabled ancient city of Petra in southern Jordan, located about 45 miles southeast of the Dead Sea. Both Zitzen and Burkhart invested several years of preparation in Syria, learning Arabic and Middle Eastern customs. Both of them traveled dressed as Arabs, and both left accounts of their travels that helped advance Europeans' knowledge of and interest in the land of the Bible. In 1815, a very interesting woman, English lady Hester Stanhope, excavated or plundered at Ashkelon, an ancient city of Mediterranean coast of modern Israel, looking for buried treasure on the basis of a purportedly medieval document. She didn't find any treasure, but using what I would consider to be very questionable logic, she destroyed a large statue of a Roman emperor that she found thinking that by smashing the statue, she would discourage other people from coming to plunder the site looking for ancient artifacts. In 1820, the year of Joseph Smith's first vision, the American Levi Parsons became the first Protestant missionary to travel to Jerusalem. He was followed by Pliny Fisk in 1825 and many others in the succeeding decades. Parsons and Fisk were supported by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, founded in 1810 to help Protestants prepare the world for the return of Christ. In 1829, the year in which the majority of the Book of Mormon translation was produced, Henry H. Millman published the first academic history of ancient Israel in his book entitled History of the Jews, the second edition of which came out the following year in 1830. In 1838 to 1841, the American Edward Robinson, a religiously conservative Bible scholar and linguist who sought to support the historical reliability of the Bible, explored Palestine with American missionary Eli Smith and correctly identified many biblical sites for the first time in the modern era. Their work did not only generated great public interest in the land of the Bible, but more importantly laid the foundation for the serious study of the historical geography of Palestine and the future field of biblical archaeology. Robinson later returned to Palestine in 1852 for further exploration. 1838 to 1839, David Roberts, a Scottish landscape artist, toured Egypt, Palestine and Lebanon. Lithographs prepared from his drawings were published between 1842 and 1849 and became instantly popular. They're still well known today due to their detailed but romanticized depiction of important sites in life in the Middle East. In 1841, Robinson and Smith's three-volume Biblical Researches in Palestine, Mount Sinai, and Arabia Petra was published in Boston. In 1848, before I get to 1848, let me just introduce this thought. During the early 1800s, a great number of people from different countries traveled to Palestine to investigate potential trade routes through the Jordan Rift Valley between the Sea of Galilee and the Red Sea. One of the most unusual of these was the 1848 expedition conducted by the United States Navy, led by William Lynch, which traveled from the Mediterranean coast near Haifa to the Sea of Galilee and then down the Jordan River to the Dead Sea, gathering information again about possible trade routes. While successful in obtaining a wealth of important data about the Dead Sea and its environs, neither the Lynch expedition nor any other one was able to successfully champion Palestine as a competitive trade route. Accounts of these explorers' experiences, however, were part of an ongoing stream of publication that maintained a heightened American and European public interest in the land of the Bible. Even this abbreviated sketch of the early recovery of the ancient world of the Bible in the first half of the 19th century demonstrates its chronological correlation with the restoration of the Lord's gospel and church through the prophet Joseph Smith. 
One aspect of the divine preparation of the world for the restoring the gospel was the initial recovery of the biblical world and the context it provided for understanding the Lord's work in previous dispensations. I will now illustrate this specific correlation with the following five points. Number one, the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith first was, was first visited and tutored by the angel Moroni in 1823. He received the Book of Mormon plates in 1827. The bulk of the translation occurred in 1829, and the Book of Mormon was first published in March 1830. Martin Harris, a friend and early scribe to Joseph Smith, sought confirmation of the young prophet's gift. Traveling to New York City in early 1828 with a copy of some reformed Egyptian characters from the gold plates, Martin Harris visited Columbia College professors Charles Anson, who Harris describes as, quote, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. He also visited Samuel Mitchell. According to Harris, Professor Anton said, among other things, that the characters Harris showed him were, quote, ancient, were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic. And he said they were true characters. Dr. Mitchell sanctioned what Professor Anton had said respecting both the characters and the translation, end quote, Joseph Smith history. With Champollion's successful decipherment of some Egyptian demotic and hieroglyphic characters in Europe by 1824, Harris's consultations with professors Anton and Mitchell in 1828 emphasizes a general awareness of the contemporary recovery of Egyptian aspects of the ancient world of the Bible. Furthermore, it is striking that Joseph Smith was involved in the decipherment and publication of the Book of Mormon an ancient text with roots in the world of the Bible. At the same time, other ancient languages and texts from that world were being discovered and deciphered and published. The prophet translating scripture, the scholars translating non-scripture texts. As BYU professor Wilfred Griggs has observed, quote, Inasmuch as the Book of Mormon is a record of peoples who migrated from the Old World to the Americas, the imprint of the ancient Near Eastern cultures from which the peoples originated can still be found within that record. An understanding of the international currents flowing around the world of Lehi can help explain the presence of Hebrew, Egyptian, Babylonian, and even Greek cultural elements in the records of Lehi and his ancestors." End quote. The recovery of the world of the Bible thus provides a context for the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, as well as helping us better understand its content. Second point of correlation, the Book of Abraham. The Book of Abraham derives from papyrus documents preserved with four mummies that the prophet Joseph Smith purchased from Michael Chandler in Kirtland, Ohio in July 1835. These four mummies were part of a group of 11, which were acquired by Chandler in the United States in 1833. Chandler toured them in the eastern states, selling some of the mummies as he went until he sold the last four to Joseph Smith. The mummies had been removed from Egypt about 1820 by Antonio Lobolo, who had worked in Egypt from 1817 to 1822, excavating Egyptian antiquities for Bernardino Dravetti as well as on his own. Joseph Smith, according to his journal entries, worked on these papyrus documents during the remainder of 1835 and then again a little in 1842 as he prepared them for publication in the Times and Seasons. As former BYU professor H. Donnell Peterson has commented, while the prophet's precise methodology remains unknown, Latter-day Saints accept that it was principally by divine revelation rather than his knowledge of languages that Joseph Smith produced the English text of the Book of Abraham, end quote. Of the Abraham material published in the Pearl of Great Price, only facsimile one is preserved on the 11 small papyrus fragments known to have survived from what the prophet originally had. But all three facsimiles are Egyptian in nature, and they and the content of the Book of Abraham itself are more fully understood and appreciated because of the recovery of the world of the Bible that began in the early 1800s. Indeed, the modern availability of the Book of Abraham results in part from the role the Bolo played in the initial recovery of the Egyptian portion of the world of the Bible in the early 1800s and from the public interest in such matters upon which Chandler capitalized by touring his mummies, charging admission for the opportunity to see a real live Egyptian mummy. Joseph Smith was definitely aware of the recovery of ancient documents and artifacts from the world of the Bible that was taking place in his lifetime.
and he personally participated in the excitement that these ex discoveries generated. After all, not everyone had Egyptian mummies on display in their city like the saints in Nauvoo did. Point number three, as far as correlation goes, Orson Hyde's mission to Jerusalem. As one of the first apostles in this dispensation, Orson Hyde, also born in 1805, was charged by Joseph Smith in April 1840 to dedicate, quote, the land of Palestine for the building up of Jerusalem and the gathering of Abraham's posterity, end quote. Elder Hyde arrived in Jerusalem after an 18-month journey that included many hardships and divine intervention on his behalf. On October 24, 1841, he walked eastward out of the small walled city of Jerusalem and climbed the Mount of Olives, where he knelt down and pronounced the first apostolic dedicatory prayer in this dispensation for Jerusalem, the Holy Land, and the gathering of Israel. An account of his experience is entitled, A Voice from Jerusalem, or A Sketch of the Travels and Ministry of Elder Orson Hyde, was published in Liverpool, England, and Boston, in 1842 and was a significant contribution to the growing number of accounts of travel in the Middle East published at that time. Orson Hyde's mission did not specifically involve the recovery of the ancient world of the Bible, but he was, he was not motivated by economic possibilities, by sightseeing, by adventure, or even by antiquities. But he traveled a similar route. He saw similar sites and stayed in the same Latin convent in Jerusalem as so many other explorers and missionaries did in that time period. Furthermore, his mission signaled another way in which the Lord's power began to move across the Middle East. The current Orson Hyde Memorial Garden on the western slope of the Mount of Olives commemorates his mission to Jerusalem and the Holy Land in 1841. Correlation point number four, Joseph Smith in Biblical Hebrew. The prophet Joseph Smith developed a keen interest in learning languages, including Hebrew and Greek, the primary languages of the Bible. One illustration of this is that the prophet procured Hebrew books in November 1835 and commenced his personal study. Eventually, Professor Joshua Sykes was hired to teach biblical Hebrew to Joshua, uh, to Joseph, and other church leaders in Kirtland from January 6th to March 29th, 1836. In his journal entry dated February 17th, 1836, Joseph Smith wrote, quote, attended the school and read and translated biblical Hebrew with my class as usual. My soul delights in reading the word of the Lord in the original, and I am determined to pursue the study of the languages until I shall become the master of them, if I am permitted to live long enough, end quote. Joseph Smith's personal efforts to learn biblical Hebrew lend credence to the importance of understanding the Bible and other scriptures in their linguistic, historical, and cultural context, something which is much more possible to do since the recovery of the ancient world of the Bible, which began in the early 1800s. Correlation point number five, the pro proposed Nauvoo Museum. The May 15, 1843 edition of the Latter-day Saint publication, Times and Seasons, was entitled, quote, To the Saints Among All Nations. It contained the following exhortation, apparently from Joseph Smith, quote, According to a revelation received not long since, it appears to be the duty of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to bring to Nauvoo their precious things, such as antiquities, as well as inscriptions and hieroglyphics, for the purpose of establishing a museum of the great things of God and the inventions of men at Nauvoo." End quote. Editor John Taylor stated in an appended comment that this museum should be, quote, a receptacle of everything new and old, ancient and modern, antique, fanciful and substantial. Indeed, anything and everything that has a tendency to throw light upon ancient nations, their manners, customs, implements of husbandry and of war, their costume, ancient records, manuscripts, paintings, hieroglyphics. Anything that is calculated to enlighten the mind, enlarge the understanding, gratify the curiosity, and give general information, end quote. It is striking to me that leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1843 Nauvoo had such a grand and broad vision of the Restoration, a vision that included the value of ancient texts and artifacts then being discovered in the Middle East. 
To me, this emphasizes, one, their awareness of the recovery process going on in their own time. Two, their estimation of the importance of the knowledge of the world of the Bible for better understanding the scriptures. And three, their desire to participate in the gathering together of all things in one. I will now make a few observations by way of summary and conclusion. Of course, there were exaggerated claims and errors in decipherment and interpretation as the discovery or recovery of the world of the Bible got underway. And even with the discoveries and advances highlighted above, the recovery of the world of the Bible was still in its infancy in 1850. However, the efforts of hardy, curious, and insightful explorers and deciphers were extremely significant in inaugurating this recovery and building a foundation for our present knowledge of that ancient world and its value for better understanding our religious and cultural heritage. The process of discovery and of refining our knowledge of the ancient world of the Bible continues to this day. As outlined above, the beginnings of the recovery of the world of the Bible are closely linked to and were divinely coordinated with the restoration of the gospel in general and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham in particular. These ancient scriptures were translated and published in an age flush with the dis excitement of discovery and decipherment. No wonder the Lord commanded Joseph Smith in 1833, as we have recorded in DNC 9353, quote, it is my will that you should obtain a knowledge of history and of countries and of kingdoms, of the laws of God and the laws of man, and all this for the salvation of Zion. End quote. I believe this injunction is application to all Latter-day Saints and not just the prophet Joseph Smith. I must emphasize that the recovery of texts and artifacts from the ancient world of the Bible does not prove the truthfulness of the restoration of the gospel in these latter days. But such discoveries definitely help us to better understand the world in which the ancient Israelites and their prophets lived and to better understand the scriptures which they produced for us. The Americans Edward Robinson and Eli Smith, who I mentioned a minute ago, published their book, Biblical Researches in Palestine, Mount Sinai, and Arabia Petra in 1841. I love the perceptive observation of a British commentator who suggested that divine power had influenced their accomplishments. He wrote, quote, the gratification of their own curiosity was the only motive, perhaps, of which they were conscious. Little did they think that they were obeying an impulse from on high and that Jehovah meant them to be witnesses of his truth to the after ages of the world, end quote. This commentator believed that the work of Edward Robinson and Eli Smith was divinely directed. I do too, but I wouldn't limit this assessment to just Robinson and Smith. I believe that this also applies to people such as Champollion, Laird, Rawlinson, and many others who were involved in the early recovery of the world of the Bible and who were knowingly or unknowingly moved upon by the Lord as part of his plan to bring about the gathering together of all things in one in this last and greatest gospel dispensation. This perspective shouldn't be too surprising to Latter-day Saints who believe the Lord also directed such people as Columbus and the founders of the United States in their efforts. In closing, it is a great blessing to have the spiritual light of the restored gospel in our lives. It is also a real blessing to have the knowledge of the ancient world of the Bible, which the Lord has provided for us in this dispensation in conjunction with the gospel, so that we have the opportunity to deepen our understanding and appreciation of his words and works, that we may more fully take advantage of this opportunity to enrich our own study of the ancient scriptures. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this Sperry Symposium address, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This address by Dana Pike was given on October 29, 2004. Dr. Pike teaches in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU.